Um, okay, so um, thanks everyone for being here. We are at the Cherry Point Science Forum. It is a beautiful, sunny morning. So thank you for tuning in um, from where you are. And um, to start off, we wanted to start with a quick little poll to, so Rondi, if you could launch that for us, um, to ask you where you're tuning in from, um, how you heard about this event, and um, have you ever been to the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve before? So um, while folks are taking that poll that hopefully is getting launched. I apologize. Um, I think because I made you the host, I'm no longer able to launch polls. Ah, got it. There we All go, right. sorry. Everyone should see it now. Um, so while folks are taking that um, quick poll, um, I wanted to start off with a little bit of a land acknowledgement. So um, we are on the ancestral homelands of the Coast Salish peoples whose tribal treaty rights we support and for whose enduring care of these lands and waters, we are deeply grateful. And so um, I included an opalescent nudibranch here, which actually was taken at uh, Cherry Point um, this past summer at one of our intertidal surveys um, as a reminder of the wonder and the abundance of the Salish Sea. Um, and the gratitude for those who have cared for this land and water since time immemorial. And so Cherry Point is home to Lummi and Samiamu and has shared unusual accustomed grounds with um, many other Coast Salish tribes. And um, with land acknowledgements, I always like to also include um, an ask. And so um, my ask of you today is to do a little bit more um, digging and learn a little bit more about the um, Coach Sailors peoples and um, their perspective on Cherry Point and the historical uses, um, especially as we have the um, Cherry Point Management Plan, which um, will get mentioned a little bit later in this. Um, I think it's really important to keep the tribal perspective in there. And um, lastly, I just wanted to say that with the tribal treaty rights, um, we often refer to them as tribal treaty rights, but um, I wanna remind you all that just because it has the word tribal in there um, and just because you might not um, be a tribal member, it doesn't mean that it doesn't apply to you. So um, those tribal treaty rights involve all of us. And so I encourage you to do a little bit more digging. And with that, we have almost everyone has taken the poll. So I will end it and I will share results. So um, where are you tuning in from? We kind of have a mixed bag of Ferndale, Blaine Birch Bay, Bellingham, somewhere else in Whatcom County, and um, actually a few folks from outside of Whatcom County. Um, and then how did you hear about this event? Um, a few different ways. A friend, it seems like it's one of the big ones, which is awesome. So thank you everyone who helped spread the word about it. Um, some e-news, some social media attended in the past. Um, great. And other. Um, and then uh, it looks like 70% have been to Cherry Point before and 30% have not. So those 30% uh, who have not been, I hope that you um, get to go up there sometime and check it out because it's truly an amazing place. So um, I need to close that. Sorry. All right, moving on. Um, if I can. So um, a little bit about uh, Zoom. I'm sure you are all <laughs> way too familiar with Zoom by now. Um, so this is in the Zoom webinar format today. Um, you will be muted and your video will be turned off. Um, you can type questions in the Q&A box, which should be located at the bottom of your screen at that little pop-up. Um, there's also a chat box and you can use the chat box as well. Um, but we ask that you put all questions in the Q&A box um, to help us keep track of stuff. The chat box is a great place if you have a link to something that you wanna share or we're sharing a link, we'll probably put it in the chat box. Um, please type your questions into the Q&A box. We'll probably, um, you can do that at any time. We'll probably hold most of the questions until the end of the talks, um, unless there's something that um, needs clarification um, during the presentation. Um, I also want to remind you that this is being recorded um, and after this presentation, because um, we now have your emails because you all signed up through the Zoom RCP link, we will send you a follow up email with um, links to relevant information from today as well as the recording. So um, if you have to pop off early or something like that, you can watch um, the full recording later and or share it with friends. Um, and then I also put uh, Rondi's email in there. Rondi is our Aquatic Reserves 
um, AmeriCorps, who is helping out today with the technical side of stuff, um, and did a lot of work in putting this together. So um, you can contact her if you need to, and Randy, if you want to just say hello so people can see you. Hello. Thank you, thank you everyone, for coming. We really appreciate you tuning in, um, and we hope that you enjoy the event. Awesome. Thanks. So um, I was going through uh, previous, uh, or I was going through a bunch of photos um, to put together this um, little PowerPoint today. And uh, this is one of the photos I came across. Does anybody remember when we last did this in person? It was in 2019 in this photo here. Um, so I know that everyone's suffering from Zoom fatigue and we really appreciate that um, you're here, hopefully enjoying it from the comfort of your home, maybe in your pajamas, maybe eating some pancakes or something from home, sipping a nice warm cup of coffee or tea. Um, and so um, we don't know what next year brings, but we, in the meantime, um, we really appreciate you being here and showing up today to join us. So um, today's schedule, I'm gonna give an introduction um, and then followed by Bertie Davenport from Washington Department of Natural Resources that will um, also give a little bit of an introduction to the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve. Um, then uh, at 11, or, sorry, 1020, uh, Dr. Christopher Harley will give a presentation on um, the impacts from the heat wave this past summer on our near shore uh, marine life and uh, then we'll take a little bit of a break um, at 11.20 where you can stretch, get all refreshed and return back at 11.25 to listen to Casey McLean from SR3 to talk about um, marine uh, wildlife rehabilitation um, research and response. Um, and uh, at 12.25 we'll um, end on some closing thoughts and then after that at 12 30 we'll end and you can enjoy the rest of your weekend and enjoy this beautiful sunshine that we finally have after so much rain um so um as i mentioned before um i'm eleanor hines your north sound bay keeper lead scientist at resources um and so resources hosts an aquatic reserves americorps um which currently is randy nordahl um and we work closely with the cherry point aquatic reserve Citizen Stewardship Committee um, that I'll talk about a little bit later. And so we all closely work with the Washington Department of Natural Resources um, Aquatic Reserves Program, which oversees um, the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve. And I'm trying really hard not to use acronyms because we use those a lot. And um, so here we have our two AmeriCorps. On the left-hand side, we have uh, Melanie Lichterman. She put in a lot of hard work and effort. So um, I just wanted to express some gratitude to her today. Um, she Her term ended on October 15th. And so hopefully she's able to join us today, um, but I know she had a pretty busy schedule. So um, I just wanted to say thank you to her. And then Rondi on the right-hand side here, um, she is here today, as you saw her earlier, um, and she also did a lot of work putting um, this together today. And she is currently the person to reach out to if you have any questions about the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve um, Citizen Stewardship Committee and getting involved um, or other stuff like that. So um, for those unfamiliar with Cherry Point, um, I like to think of it as like being in the heart of the Salish Sea. It's circled in red on this map. Um, and then a little closer up, it's a little bit uh, west of Ferndale, as you can see on the map here. Um, and it's in a truly unique area. And so um, I wanted to share today a little bit of perspective on Cherry Point. Um, hopefully most of you, or it sounds like a lot of you have been there. Um, and I hope you all have your own special stories of this area to, to share um, with your friends and family. Um, I know that I first really became interested in the Cherry Point um, area when the coal export terminal was proposed there 10 years ago. Um, and uh, the science forum, along with a lot of our community, ongoing community science projects sort of stemmed from the sense of urgency to learn more about this special area to ensure that we could better um, protect it. And so a quick little personal story. Um, uh, though I have many uh, great memories of Cherry Point and hopefully we'll have many more uh, new memories to make um, into the future. Um, I thought I'd share this one, this quick one with you all today. Um, a few years ago, uh, we did sort of an impromptu field trip up to Cherry Point led by um, Mike McKay, who worked for Lemmy Natural Resources. He is now retired. So we were just walking around the beach trying to um, 
we weren't really sure what we were going to find. Um, we were looking around maybe for um, herring spawning or something like that. Um, we got a lot of information shared with us while we were looking as we weren't seeing anything. And then right at the very end, uh, somebody spotted um, a little bit of eelgrass on the beach that had these herring eggs um, attached to them. And so we put them into this Tupperware dish and um, with some water. And lo and behold, before we knew it, there were little uh, baby herring just popping out. Um, and so that was really cool and neat to see and really special. And for those of you who um, don't know what herring are, they're a forage fish. And so they're really important in um, the Sailor Sea food web because they serve as um, a food for a lot of species that we really care about. Um, and so these aren't uh, the cherry point herring. I think it was a little bit too early in the season for them to be spawning. Um, but for those of you who don't know, the cherry point, the cherry point herring um, are a unique stock of herring that were um, the most abundant in the Salish Sea in the 1970s and then crashed and haven't quite since recovered. Um, but they're a super interesting herring stock. They spawn a little bit later. And it's just another example of, um, of why cherry point is really worth protecting. And so um, this photo here, I believe was taken maybe by um, uh, our citizen, citizen stewardship committee member, Rick Hahn. Um, and uh, I just love it because it shows the herring spawn, the milky white water. Um, you have a bunch of seabirds and you also have seals in the background. And so um, while um, the abundant wildlife here maybe not might not be quite as abundant as it once was, it's all still worth protecting. And it's such a great thing to witness if you haven't been there yet. Um, so the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Stewardship Committee um, is made up of stakeholders who are bringing more life to the Cherry Point Management Plan. They um, follow what's happening at Cherry Point. They provide comments and technical, on technical documents. Um, they also do a variety of education and outreach events, such as this one today that you're tuning into. Um, we also participate in a bunch of community science programs. Um, there are monthly meetings. They are the first Wednesday of every month, 3 to 5 p.m. And um, I want to point out to you all that any of you could join the Citizen Search Committee at any point. Um, and you can email Rondi and her emails there. It's rondin at resources.org. Um, and so uh, you can also email her just to find out about um, the next upcoming meet or meeting, um, which will actually be next Wednesday. So um, if you want the Zoom, uh, links to that, just go ahead and email her and you can join. No pressure to join. Um, you can just kind of see a little bit more what it's about. Um, and so some of the stuff that we participate in include um, ocean acidification monitoring uh, with the Department of Natural Resources. So we help on the local level while they do um, their statewide thing. Um, intertidal monitoring. Uh, marine bird monitoring. And I wanted to point out that we started marine bird monitoring as well as um, intertidal back in 2013. And so in 2023, we're hoping that we'll be able to put together a more comprehensive report after 10 years of data. And so maybe this might be a future topic for one of these forums. Um, we also do sea star wasting syndrome monitoring and looking for stars like this guy. Um, we do events like what's the point? Um, usually we get a few hundred folks out on the beach to learn more about intertidal um, craters. Um, and last year we did more of a, an online um, venue, uh, but hopefully this year we'll see what happens. Um, you'll get a link in your follow-up email to learn more about this event. Usually it's hosted during um, a great low tide event in June. Um, we do other kinds of outreach events. Um, to help educate, because it's really important to make sure that everybody knows what the Aquatic Reserve is. And so, um, Randy, if you want to queue up the pledge link right now. So, um, Cherry Point is a really awesome place, and um, we hope that you all appreciate it as much as we do. And so, um, we'd like to ask you all today, if you can, um, we'll also get a link in the follow-up email as well, um, to take this pledge to do one new Thing to help protect Cherry Point. So some of you might already be doing quite a few things already, which is awesome and we really appreciate that. But um, if you could take a look at the list and pick one thing that you think you could actually commit to doing um, that would help protect the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve, we'd really appreciate that. So um, that link hopefully will be shared <laughs> and um, we'll, we'll share it again later 
I'm sure. Um, and so with that, um, the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Stewardship Committee brings stakeholders together to protect the special area. And so next up, you will hear from Washington Department of Natural Resources Aquatic Reserves Program Manager, Bertie Davenport, to hear more about the DNR management perspective of this wonderful place. So thank you. And Bertie, you are up next. And sorry, I gotta find my mouse and stop share so you can share your screen now. Right, thank you. Can everyone hear me? I can hear you great. Okay, good. We're just waiting for my screen to come up. Got it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really great to be here this morning. Um, beautiful morning and um, so you covered a lot about the citizen stewardship. Oh dear. I'm getting a message that says, um, having trouble loading my, I was afraid of this. I have your presentation that I just brought up. Do you want me to share it for you? Um, yeah, and it, it is saying that I can't start screen sharing while the other participant is sharing, but yeah, you can go ahead and pull it up. That's fine. Oh, sorry. I, okay. All right. Does that look okay? That looks fine. Okay. okay. Um, so um, I'm Bertie Davenport. I'm the Aquatic Reserves Program Manager. And this is just a quick introduction to the program and Cherry Point. And then we can get on with the other presentations. So next slide. So um, aquatic reserves have been, um, the program's been around for about 20 years, but um, the first official management plans um, were not uh, completed until uh, 2006. And Cherry Point's plan was completed in um, 2010. So we just are finishing the um, first 10 year update of the Cherry Point plan. Um, the reserves are designated for a 90 year term and um, they, um, you know, they protect uh, environmental resources and they can also be used for research and education, which is something that we're really trying to focus on. Um, so why don't you do the next slide. Cherry Point's just over 3,000 acres. Um, a few years ago when the Gateway Pacific um, terminal um, permits were not, um, didn't go through, um, we went through a process to add that property to the reserve. So it's a small acreage, but a very important piece to um, now have included. And um, some of the highlights of what we're doing is, um, uh, a research project on cherry point herring, larval cherry point herring. And, um, you know, as I just mentioned, the management plan update is posted online um, for comment. And um, I see Rondi has got a link to the plan in the chat. Um, and so we'd love to get your comments on that plan or at least scan through it and look at the pictures and check it out. Um, well, there's a few pictures. There's some great maps in the appendices, so please uh, check out the appendices. And also a lot of really important in um, biological information that I think anyone interested in Cherry Point can find useful. Okay, next slide. And um, Eleanor really covered the Citizen Stewardship Committee, but what I'd just like to say is um, resources and the Citizen Stewardship Committee are really important local partners for the reserve program. And, and uh, much of the work um, for the site is carried on through those guys. Um, we're all based in Olympia other than Erica Bleakey. And so it's, it's difficult for us to do the work um, on the site. So having local partners is really important. So I appreciate everything that the committee has done. Um, and next slide. So um, our big project this year has been to get started on the larval herring and Dungeness crab light trap research, um, which we've partnered with the Lummi um, Natural Resources 
program and uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife has also assisted us. But um, we're getting some really important data from this and we hope to present it. Um, I think the Whatcom Science Forum or not quite sure of the name, there'll be a presentation there and also at Salish Sea on this project. Um, uh, but I can't quite see, I have a bunch of different, um, I can't quite see my this screen very well. Okay, here we go. So um, just to show you what's going on here, um, the light in the center photo, they're deploying the light trap, which looks very simple, but it's a pretty complex array with a battery and a light and funnels that the small um, fish and crab larva enter into. And we put it out overnight and check it, or for two nights, and then check it and um, release uh, the critters. And we take some for sampling. So Allison on the left has a huge uh, catch of Dungeness carb clarab larva. And um, one of the largest uh, samples of Dungeness crab larva ever collected in the Sailor Sea. So that's pretty amazing. And on the upper right, she's looking um, through our new camera microscope, which is awesome. And you can see uh, she's looking at a polychaete. And on the screen behind her, you can see the really sharp image of the polychaete um, in the viewfinder. And then uh, lower right is a uh, herring larva, a little chewed on by the crabs, but um, this is what we're looking for. And so having a really good microscope helps us to ID these fish and crab larvae. So more on that soon. And then there's one more slide to show you um, uh, an image of um, a, little, a little crab. And so we're getting um, really good data and also sharp images that we can use for training and uh, sharing this data with everybody and you know kind of illustrating what we're finding so pretty exciting stuff and you'll there'll be a lot more to come on this um, when uh, Allison is done uh, analyzing and and uh, writing up the data along with um, along with the uh, uh, Devon Flawed from Lummi Natural Resources okay so that's all I have for my brief intro and um, I hope you enjoy the presentations today and I will see you all later great thank you um so Bertie that was really great and I'm excited to hear more about that light trap stuff um, in the future and so next we have Robert Kay, who is a member of the Trey Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Stewardship Committee, who is going to introduce our next speaker. Robert, take it away. Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. Yes. Great. Okay. Well, um, my name is Robert Kay, and I'm a member of the Cherry Point Citizen Stewardship Advisory Committee. Um, you've heard a little bit about it, and it's a really good group of people. Um, it's my distinct pleasure and honor to be able to introduce. Our first speaker, uh, he's Dr. Christopher Harley. He's a full professor in the Department of Zoology at the University of British Columbia. Um, he's, he focuses his research on why plants and animals live where they live, how their distribution will shift as a result of global climate change. He studies how abiotic forces such as temperature and ocean acidification and biological relationships um, such as predation, competition, and facilitation structure coastal marine communities. So that, that's a mouthful and a whole bunch of uh, stuff there, but uh, Chris is a very personable fellow and I think you're really gonna enjoy his presentation. So uh, take it away, Chris. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, also, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity uh, to share some results with, uh, with the group today. And let me know if you are not about seeing the <laughs> opening slide of a uh, beautiful photograph of a whole bunch of deceased mussels. Um, 
I uh, join you today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, uh, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish peoples. And the, the work that I'm going to describe today takes place in the territories of, of a, a number of additional groups. And I uh, it, sort of acknowledge the importance of continuing our relationships with those groups. And uh, some of the uh, work that we're doing is also transboundary and uh, working with, with tribal biologists in the United States uh, on this project as well. Um, so uh, to take um, sort of that introduction uh, and, and try to make it a little bit more concrete into sort of what uh, my students and I study and why, um, I thought I would, well, oh, that's right. See, I get so excited about things that I always forget to um, include acknowledgement. So I put them at the beginning. Uh, so first of all, uh, uh, in addition to, to the, you know, collaborators elsewhere, I have a, an active group of students at the University of British Columbia uh, without whom this work would have been much less rich. Uh, so I uh, thank them for all of the uh, work that they've done on this and for making my uh, life and career much more interesting than it would be otherwise. And then also on the bottom right, my family, I, I owe them a thanks because, you know, on family camping trips, they will often hear dad say, hey, let's take an afternoon and go look at dead barnacles instead of doing something that you kids want to do. And they're reasonably tolerant of those sorts of activities. Um, right. So climate change. That is one of the main interests in my research program. And you all, uh, if you've tuned in to this, you may have your own reasons for being concerned about climate change, but I'll outline uh, some, of, some of mine. Um, one is it is going to impact species that we care about. This is actually already impacting species that we care about. Um, the weird sort of ear shaped thing in this photograph is a is a northern or pinto abalone that in British Columbia here was an important commercial fishery for a while, uh, an important sort of cultural uh, resource to First Nations people for a long time. Uh, but through over exploitation um, that is, those numbers have, have gone way down and now changes in temperature and especially ocean acidification are slowing recovery. Uh, sea urchin uh, poking up from the corner there, also a very important commercial crop vulnerable to the aspects of climate change. And then we have other species that you know we may not eat directly, um, although you can eat kelp if you're devoted, um, and eelgrass. But those are our habitats. So these species provide you know places for crabs to hide or juvenile salmon to migrate uh, along, and uh, form nursery habitats. So these types of species are are affected by climate change. And as a scientist, I could you know, show you data about biodiversity and why it matters that we have a lot of species. And I'll actually return to this idea at the end. Um, but I can also just tell you as a person, I love being able to go out to the shore and look in tide pools and see scenes like this with all the color and all the variety of life. And if we don't have to lose that, I would prefer not to because I just like it. It makes me a happier person. Now, you may have noticed that all of these photographs are from uh, rocky shores, and that is because rocky shores are really good for studying the effects of climate change. We uh, uh, have species like, oops, I'm trying to do something that is not going to happen. All right, let's do this instead. Uh, a lot of species on rocky shores already live pretty close to the, um, the, the limits of their tolerance. So when things change in the environment, we see that reflected in, uh, you know, for example, mussels that have just died after a period of hot weather. Uh, so uh, it, it's not that you have to bring things in and run complicated analyses in the lab and look for heat shock protein expression, although you can. Um, you can also just go out and say, oh man, it smells terrible today. And it's because there's all this, you know, rotting muscle uh, on, on the beach. We also have really interesting and strong interactions between species. So here is a sea star that has been turned over while it is having lunch. 
and you can see the muscle there in its clutches that it has pressed up against its mouth, uh, sea stars turn their stomachs inside out and push them into the muscle shell to digest their prey. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to figure out what sea stars are eating than it is to figure out what you know, hawks are eating, or um, even things like like um, mountain lions, and and uh, behind the sea star there, there's you know mussels and barnacles are competing for space on the shore and trying to overgrow one another. The anemones in that photo are green because uh, they have endosymbiotic uh, um, algae, so mutualisms are important. So all these relationships are playing out in a way that's very easy to, to observe and understand. And when you combine those things, you get patterns. Uh, this is a photograph from Tatoosh Island, just off the tip of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington. And we have a zone of barnacles high up on the shore, and then a, a seaweed zone, and then the mussel bed, and then a different species of seaweed, and then kelps, and then surf grass at the bottom. And that sort of layer cake pattern uh, is something that you can observe from one place to the next and from one time to the next. And when that changes, then you know, um, uh, you know, if the upper limit of something changed, maybe that was because it's getting hotter. If the lower limit is changing, maybe that's because something happened with predators that are lurking down lower on the shore. All right, so let's, uh, let's give you two examples of how things have changed through time already. And the first of those is with a humble seaweed, uh, the Horn of Plenty seaweed, which is this sort of golden green um, uh, thing here. And there's two things to notice about this photograph. Uh, one, this surface is a north facing surface, and that's where this seaweed really likes to be. This side over here faces more west and south, which gets hotter, and you don't have um, this particular species. The other thing is what looks like snow or something up here at the top, that is bleached seaweed. Uh, so there was a low tide that was sufficiently hot shortly before this photo was taken um, that it killed uh, the seaweeds up at the upper edge of its distributional zone. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, way back in the day for my graduate work at the University of Washington, I studied um, these relationships to figure out why this seaweed lives where it does. And so it doesn't get too much higher. And then down here, um, the bottom edge is bounded by muscle bed. So I also looked at why it doesn't get too much lower. And we can do that by just chiseling up bits of this stuff and then gluing it down wherever you want. So if you, you know, if you want me to glue some down in your yard, I can do that. And then we can prove that it can't survive in your yard because there's no seawater for it. Uh, so here is the zone it normally lives in. Uh, so the Horn of Plenty seaweed zone. And you can um, take it out from the middle and put it out by itself. So no neighbors. You can put it inside of a copper ring, uh, which keeps out the grazers. All the little snails uh, uh, that would uh, potentially like to eat this can't get over the copper, just like you can use copper in your garden to protect things from slugs. If we transplant the seaweed up too high, this is the rock that it used to be on, but it's uh, the seaweed has all died up here because it's just out of the water for too long. It gets too hot and too dry. So this upper limit um, is set by physical stress. So too hot, too dry. If you transplant it down here, it's hard to see, but this is the rock that used to have the seaweed on it. It's all been eaten. This seaweed here is in the process of being eaten and the one inside of the copper fence protection is doing great. So the lower limit here is set by these biological interactions, particularly being eaten by something else that lives a little bit lower on the shore. So I, I set that up uh, because it'll help um, uh, sort of uh, contextualize the next example. But uh, we do have some information on how the Horn of Plenty seaweed uh, has been changing through time. And that comes courtesy of my PhD supervisor, who unfortunately passed away a few years ago. His name uh, was Bob Payne. So this is a picture of Bob uh, high on the rock and me lower down. Uh, here is the upper limit of Horn of Plenty seaweed. And he had been collecting data on how high up the shore that lived for decades and never even graphed it. Uh, he was just a really patient biologist and an excellent natural historian. And then um, uh, I got involved in this project. And so when, by the time I was involved, he would stand up there uh, in safety and I would stand lower down. So this was sort of a typical day in the field with Bob. And uh, here are the data that he collected prior to my involvement. And 
what impresses me most about this is how boring it is. There was just hardly anything happened to the upper limit of this seaweed for about 15 years, and yet Bob was out there every two weeks um, uh, recording its position. In the 90s, though, things got exciting for the seaweed, and the upper limit um, came down the shore. And uh, at this point, uh, because he sampled so frequently, we could figure out exactly within a sort of a two week window where these drops occurred. And it was during a heat wave in 93, during a heat wave in 94, and during a slightly more significant heat wave in 1995, all of which occurred during very calm weather. So there was no wave splash or spray to rescue this seaweed. And that third one was severe enough that it actually reset the limit in a semi-permanent way. And then, um, you know, the, the data came to me, it took me a long time to deal with it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't encourage my students to procrastinate like this, but one of the fringe benefits is uh, we waited long enough that it happened again in uh, 2005, another pretty good heat wave and the limit dropped again. So. We know that heat waves can matter. Um, this species is especially sensitive. These heat waves were not killing other things on the shore, just sort of this most sensitive species. Um, but it does nicely show that things have been changing through time. So climate change isn't just this, you know, future, uh, you know, thing that we're worried about. We are already living in the future relative to, um, you know, where we were even just 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, the other example I'll give you is uh, the mussel bed. Uh, so mussels are terrific habitat for hundreds of other species and um, are also food for a variety of things ranging from sea stars to sea ducks to sea otters uh, and people. And the mussel bed also sort of has that pattern where you can't move the mussels up too much higher because they would get too hot and dry and then down low they get eaten by, by sea stars. And uh, there was a master's student at the University of British Columbia in the late 50s who surveyed patterns of mussel and barnacle distribution along the southern coast of Vancouver Island um, with one spot on San Juan Island, which was, I presume, done so that he could claim it was an international study, uh, uh, and looked at the zonation patterns of barnacles and mussels. And, um, I'll show you uh, his positions, but since he collected his data in the 50s, things have gotten quite a bit warmer. Uh, these are average summer sort of daily high temperatures uh, recorded at the airport in Victoria, sort of about halfway along um, his survey region. So it's gotten, and these are in degrees C, but it's gone from, well, below room temperature to above room temperature uh, um, in the summertime, which is not exquisitely hot. But remember, these are averages over the whole summer, not the, the hottest days. Uh, so what are the consequences of that warming? Well, here are Tom Widdowson's original data. So he looked at, you can see on this shoreline, um, the sort of tan zone here are the barnacles. So he measured the upper limit of the barnacles, uh, the very obvious black uh, area is the muscle bed, so the upper limit of the muscles, and then the lower limit of the muscles. And here are the positions of those um, sort of zonal limits in the late 50s. And then I resurveyed those uh, a little over 10 years ago now, and have been trying to get back out. The pandemic has slowed us down on doing a more recent set of surveys, but hopefully this summer we will. But anyway, uh, roughly 50 years after the original data were collected, you can see these patterns have shifted. So the upper limit of the barnacles has been pushed down the shore as it's gotten hotter. The upper limit of the mussels has been pushed down the shore as it's gotten hotter. They just can't afford to be out of the water for as long because they would overheat and that would kill them. Interestingly, the lower limit of the mussels has not changed and that is because it is set by sea stars. And they are very clever about sort of crawling down into deeper water if it gets hot or hiding in shady little crevices and then coming back um, after the hot weather is passed. And as a result of this squeeze between too hot high up and you know, too many hungry mouths low down, we've lost half of the mussel bed in terms of its vertical extent in half a century. And we're fortunate that we had that older data to help us demonstrate this change had happened. 
And of the 14 places that Tom Widdowson had found muscle beds in the 50s, we only have muscle beds at 11 of those sites now. So we're seeing local extinctions of muscles where that squeeze is complete. Uh, and now there is no place um, where a muscle can live that is both above its, um, its predators and also not too hot at those, at those three sites. All right, so we know that climate change is well underway. We know that um, ecological systems are um, already responding. Uh, what can we expect to happen next? And that's where this big heat wave uh, this past summer comes in. Uh, this image is the uh, sort of computer model projection. And, and if you look at the website, Tropical Tidbit sounds like a, a made up thing run by, by children, but it's actually um, the, the people that forecast hurricanes and do this sort of off the side of their desk. So that's what the tropical part comes from. Um, but once this heat dome sort of um, settled in, they realized, you know what, instead of uh, looking at what's happening in Atlantic hurricanes, we should devote a little bit of time to um, looking at this. And the scale bar on the right is in degrees Celsius difference from the long-term average for this time of year. And that gets up to just incredibly high numbers. 20 degrees C above average is, is ridiculous. And the star on this uh, map shows you where Lytton, British Columbia is. Um, the, the tragic story of Lytton, if it was in a science fiction uh, movie, you wouldn't believe it because it set a Canadian all-time high temperature record on um, Saturday, June 26th. It uh, broke its own record on the 27th. It broke its own record again on the 28th, recording temperatures higher than have ever been recorded in Las Vegas. Uh, and then the day after that, it burned down and two people died. So um, it just uh, the, the effects of this heat dome were, were massive um, in um, many, many different ways. Uh, but I, you know, given today's topic, I'm going to focus on what happened on the shoreline. Uh, so here's a picture of Lighthouse Park in West Vancouver on June 28th, which was the hottest day of the heat wave um, in Vancouver, in the Vancouver area. And it doesn't look that bad. It's a very nice low tide. You can see where the mussel beds are. There's some seaweeds in there, some other stuff going on. Uh, but what you can't tell from this image is that most of those mussels have already died and that it is excruciatingly hot. Uh, if you look really closely, you can see um, uh, Carter, uh, uh, who's an undergrad in my lab, sort of in the middle of this photo in the distance, um, uh, recording some of this damage. And one of the things that we uh, were fortunate enough to have with us was a thermal imaging camera. Um, so before I show you the, uh, the temperatures, how high it got, uh, and, and I didn't think to actually have this as an official poll in Zoom. Uh, so you can just do this in your head. Uh, how hot do you think it got on the shore? So not the air temperature, but, you know, like the rocks and the mussels. And our options are, are you know, around 44, uh, very high 40s, uh, 54 and 56.7. So think about that for a second, sort of mentally make your choice. And then I'll tell you something about these numbers. Um, 44.1 degrees C is hot enough to kill the most thermally tolerant barnacles we have, which are the sort of the, they're, they're better at surviving high temperatures than, than humans. Uh, so that is uh, very dangerously hot. 49.6 is the temperature that Lytton got to. So that is the current record high air temperature for Canada. Um, skipping down to 56.7, that is the hottest air temperature ever measured on Earth as, a, as, as weather. And that was in Death Valley in 1913. Uh, and there's some question as to whether that, uh, that value is reliable. And if, if that one gets struck down as the all-time high you know, weather you know, air temperature, the next one would be 54.0, which is shared between Death Valley and Kuwait. So blisteringly hot. And it turns out that we saw temperatures up into the 50s. So here is the infrared camera. And uh, to orient you to what the information on this uh, image is, the number on the upper left, the 23.2, is the temperature of what that little target in the center is, which is the surface of the water, not especially hot. 
Uh, the scale bar on the right is what you should pay attention to because that shows the coolest part of the image, which is water, and the hottest part, which is rock. And some of the muscles on the shore that day got up to 56.7 degrees, which is exactly equal to the hottest air temperature measured in Earth's history by our, you know, reliable thermometers. So just astonishingly hot. And I have worked on heat waves and you know high temperatures on the shore for a long time and did not expect I would see this kind of temperature in a muscle bed in my lifetime, you know, maybe by the end of the century, but it was really hot. And we didn't cherry pick these photos. It was too hot out there to take a lot of photographs. We were worried about our own safety and spent a lot of time hiding in the shade and eating frozen grapes and drinking water. So of the handful of photos we took, this was just the hottest one. Okay, a lot of things died as a result, as you can imagine. Um, we saw dead sea stars, we saw um, crabs, we saw a lot of, of cockles uh, in the lower left, um, snails, uh, you know, sand dollars, the, the list of, of species that suffered at least some mortality is long. But, um, well, with the possible exception of cockles, which were pretty vulnerable to this, uh, most of the rest of the animals on this slide, it was only the unlucky ones that died, that just happened to be out in the sun. Um, many of these uh, crabs uh, either live under rocks or in deeper water. The sea stars are also smarter than you might think uh, for a, something that doesn't have a brain per se. Um, and they hide under rocks or in shady spots. Um, so, you know, yes, there was mortality of these species, but it wasn't, it was certainly noticeable, but it wasn't um, devastating. Um, again, with the possible exception of the cockles, where we did have mortality that I would describe as devastating, and I don't use that term lightly, were for habitat forming species like the rockweeds, the mussels, and the barnacles. And the thing that all of these have in common is that they are anchored to the rock and don't move. So they don't have the options that sea stars and crabs have of, you know, well, if it was you know, really hot on, on the Friday before the really hot weekend, let's go find a nice shady rock to hide under and that gives you some safety Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, each of these three groups. So let's start with the mussels. Uh, and you can, well, you could at the time take plenty of photos of dead mussels. You know, there's one with Vancouver in the background, there's one at a slightly um, more remote site. But I think the most sort of effective way of experiencing this, and, and I, I don't know if I'm sorry or not that I can't share the smell with you, but I can share the sound. So hopefully this works. Um, normally, if you walk over a muscle bed, it doesn't make a lot of noise because the muscles are alive and intact and they're not breaking. Once they're all dead, though, the shells just crunch underfoot. I think you can hear the sound of walking across the muscle bed on Galliano Island um, between Vancouver and Victoria. And this muscle bed just goes on and on and on and all the way down the shore for miles and miles. So this particular spot was about the size of a tennis court, and we did some sampling here to estimate that approximately 1 million animals, 1 million mussels, died uh, just in the area the size of a tennis court. Um, and th there's patterns upon patterns in this too. So that area was, you know, fairly flat and all out in the sun, but shorelines like Lighthouse Park have a mixture of, you know, south facing surfaces and, you know, uh, horizontal areas and steep walls that might face north. And that mattered an, an awful lot. So uh, I'll show you uh, a little bit of data, but I want to sort of orient you to this graph first. So the, um, x-axis here is the angle of incoming sunlight. So 90 degrees mean this means the sun is shining straight down on a surface. So something that's um, gently sloping and facing kind of south or maybe slightly southwest for early afternoon. So if you lay down on your back on a rock at the, uh, you know, at that angle and you opened your eyes, you'd be staring directly into the sun. And then you can also have um, rock surfaces that are angled, you know, at greater and greater uh, distances away from that. So, you know, as you go around a corner towards the north or over the top of a little rise to facing north, eventually 
uh, you hit zero degrees, which is where you transition from being in the sun to being in the shade. And then these negative angles are things that are, you know, uh, underneath of a rock or behind a north facing, you know, on a north facing uh, surface in the shade. And if we look at where mussels died in Stanley Park in Vancouver, if mussels were in the sun in the early afternoon on that really hot day, it was catastrophic and the mortality was was sort of 90 to 100 percent of the sort of the large uh, surface muscles there and only when you get to these very shady spots did you have survival but once you were in the shade things were um things were okay so uh, uh this is actually we can use this as a way of, of estimating how severe the heat wave impacts were at a site because if, if you really have this sort of thing where you know sun is death and shade is life that was severe um, but you could also have you know it really only had to be like the sunniest of the sunny that was that was damaging and I'll, I'll show you an example of that coming up all right seaweeds like rockweed when rockweeds die um the, there's sort of two things that that happen uh, when they are healthy, they are this olive green color. When they have been um, badly damaged, they turn to this sort of rust color or, or brownish red. Um, that indicates that they are no longer capable of photosynthesis and that tissue is eventually going to wash away. So that was the very first thing that happened. And so we could tell, you know, uh, within a day or two of the heat wave that, that uh, rockweeds uh, had suffered. But some of this damage is a little bit more su uh, subtle and takes a while to manifest. And that is the damage that occurs um, uh, near where the seaweed attaches to the rock and it becomes more brittle there. And as the sort of, uh, you know, necrotic tissue uh, begins to fail, then you lose the entire plant, even if some of the other tissue was still alive. So if, you know, like the tips of the branches were still alive, it doesn't matter if the trunk uh, has failed. Um, those tree-based terms don't actually apply directly to seaweeds, but anyway, close enough. Uh, and uh, I had a, a really good undergraduate student named Lara Calvo, who just happened to be working on this species this summer. And here is a photograph she took of her of one of her two study sites near Vancouver um, in early June before the heat wave. Um, here it is again. Uh, about two weeks after the heat wave. And you can see how much uh, of that meadow has been lost. Uh, and that process was ongoing. So she took the photograph again a month after the heat wave. And it just looks like a completely different place. And this seaweed is an important one because it is the proverbial wet blanket of the shore but in a good way, right? Uh, having that cool, damp thing on top of you as, as you know, a barnacle or a snail or a sea star uh, protects you during hot weather. And now that protective blanket is gone. And uh, here's a nice example of how important that protection is. So um, all the mussels up here are dead. You can see they're, they're open. And uh, if you pull the seaweed back, those are where all the live mussels were. So we didn't lose all of the mussels in a lot of places because we had um, some of this seaweed. So one of the things I'm worried about, um, uh, and it didn't happen fortunately this summer, but it could in the future, is if we lose the wet blanket and then we get another bad heat wave, that kills a lot of the survivors from the first one because they no longer have that protection. All right, how extensive were these die-offs? Uh, and this is a, an ongoing collaboration with um, academic government and tribal uh, biologists um, in, in the US and Canada. And so what I'm gonna show you is fairly preliminary, but uh, before I sort of put up the cartoon, um, good, bad, and really bad, uh, I wanna sort of take a moment to highlight the spatial variation and how hot things got. So the outer coast, that wasn't so bad. Uh, it's often very cloudy or foggy there. And in fact, we have this sort of tongue of relatively cool conditions that come in um, all the way to the southern end of San Juan Island and to a certain degree in here um, where, where Cherry Point is located. But once you get down into Puget Sound, up into the Strait of Georgia, and even into these fjords up here, um, it was quite hot. 
And if we look at where barnacles and mussels and clams and other species did well in the smiley faces or um, suffered where the little red X's are, it lines up pretty well with those temperature conditions. So where it was cool or very wave exposed on the outer coast, things were mostly okay. Um, this is sort of the mixed uh, one in Bamfield up in Barkley Sound because in wave exposed areas, the muscle beds were fine, but in, in wave sheltered areas, um, there was a lot of mortality. But you know, almost the entirety of the Strait of Georgia um, uh, had a lot of mortality of barnacles and mussels and, and ditto for Puget Sound. And this one is Fidalgo Bay. Um, uh, uh, we unfortunately didn't get a data point right at Cherry Point, but I would be very curious given this sort of expected temperature thing. Uh, but the southern end of, of uh, San Juan Island, the mussels there uh, were, were fine. So there's variation at these sort of large uh, scales based on how hot the temperatures got, uh, in addition to that very small scale local variation based on which direction the, the rock was facing. All right, how many animals died? Um, this, I am certain, is why this made the news. Uh, the number 1 billion was the early estimate uh, that I made, and I am very confident that that is an underestimate. Uh, so how do, how do we arrive at estimates uh, uh, for the total number of animals? Now, I'll walk you through sort of the logic here. And uh, what I have in my hand there, that is what 100 dead barnacles look like for a particular uh, species. So you can imagine how many you can fit onto a shoreline um, like uh, the, the shore on Cherry Point, if you've had a chance to, to walk along there. Uh, so we've done some, some um, quadrat based surveys and found that roughly um, in a 10 by 10 centimeter plot, which is just an area about like this, you can have about 50 dead barnacles. Um, that is an estimate that we, uh, you know, extrapolate up to, to the places we visited. We know that you can fit 100 of those little plots into a square meter. There's give or take two square meters of barnacle habitat for every linear meter of shoreline, uh, 1,000 meters in a kilometer, roughly 2,500 kilometers in the Strait of Georgia. Uh, and roughly 40% of the Strait of Georgia is good barnacle habitat. And I, I really want to emphasize that these are approximations, um, that 50 dead barnacles um, uh, might be a, a, a slight bit high, the two meters of, of barnacle habitat might be a little bit low, um, and then the 40% uh, um, you know, could also be a little bit off. But even if those are off by a bit, we're still talking about billions of dead barnacles. And that's just the barnacles. That doesn't include the mussels and the clams and the sand dollars. It also doesn't include all the little, you know, worms and amphipods and things that live in the mussel bed or in amongst the barnacles, which we just didn't have good numbers on beforehand. So we have no idea how many of those things uh, may have died. So really just a staggering numbers of, of intertidal uh, animals uh, perished within 72 hours this summer. But not everything died. Um, you know, a lot of seagrass was okay. There's some sea anemones, oysters, snails, sponges, clams, uh, even some limpets were, were, were um, seemingly unaffected or, or at least um, minimally affected by this event. Uh, what all of the um, uh, animals on this slide have in common is that none of them are native to the Salish Sea. And all of them come from parts of the world which are warmer southern Japan, eastern China, um, Taiwan, Vietnam. Uh, and so they just, in their evolutionary history, have adapted to warmer water conditions and probably thought, finally, ah, oh, it's normally so cold in Vancouver and we finally get some, some nice warm weather. Uh, it's not that none of these died at all. Some of the, the oysters did die. But this is where I want to return to this slide that you've already seen for mussels. So a mussel in the sun was a dead, a cooked mussel, or very nearly so. Uh, there was some oyster mortality, but it was really restricted to surfaces that faced directly into the sort of um, southern or southwestern sky where the uh, sun was in the early afternoon. So you can see that um, there were areas which would have been plenty hot to kill mussels, but the oysters would have been fine. So it just is an indicator that oyster tolerance is higher. 
Uh, and we can see that easily enough in, in photos like this one, which show uh, all these barnacles have dead and uh, died and they're empty. Well, not every single one. There's a few survivors in there, but barnacles are pretty tough. Uh, here are all the uh, mussels that used to be here that have died and fallen off. This photograph was taken weeks after the event. Uh, and then all the oysters here are just fine. And they uh, um, made it through this heat wave uh, with some mortality, but um, overall, this uh, was was not a an enormously big deal for a lot of these introduced or invasive species. All right, is there anything we can do? All of this news is fairly depressing, and I I was a little bit staggered by it while it was happening, and trying to remain positive, and and I want to emphasize. We need to find ways to remain positive because if we just give up and stop trying, um, then things will get worse faster. Uh, and it turns out there are things we can do. And this is a photograph of an experiment that was done by a former student of mine named Becca Cordes. And you can see these tiles that she's put on the shore. Some of them are white and some of them are black. And then there's this little area in the middle where she's studying the plants and animals that live there. And the black tiles heat up more than the white ones. So she is creating climate change on the shore or uh, by, by having this little difference in temperature. And what she found is that these uh, little grazing limpets are the heroes in this system. Because where you have those present, the heat wave impacts were relatively minimal. And where the, um, those little grazers were gone, the heat wave impacts were much stronger. And that to me is a very positive message. It suggests that ecosystems are better able to resist extreme temperatures when diversity is high. So having those grazers present, having seaweeds like the rockweed present, can help buffer the impacts of, um, of warming in these extreme events. And so while it is very difficult to manage a global problem like global warming, we can do things at local scales like conservation of biodiversity, which can help. All right, so what are the long-term prospects for, and I left this as the British Columbia coast, this would apply to Puget Sound uh, as well. Um, Fast growing species like mussels with good dispersal abilities. So things that, that you know, their little larvae can drift around and, and you know, go tens or hundreds of kilometers and establish new areas. Um, barnacles and mussels would both be in this category. It may just take them a year or two to recover. Uh, there were plenty of survivors despite all of the death and destruction. So I think the mussel beds in Vancouver will look fairly similar um, uh, uh, 2020 versus say 2023. But some species live for longer. You know, gooey ducks live for, for over a century. Some anemones live for even longer than that. Um, so those species are ones that can't get from one place to the next very easily, um, may take longer to recover. And then all those little things, you know, little worms and little amphipods and stuff, we just don't know enough about their biology to, to know, um, well, A, how many uh, we lost and then how long it might take them to recover. And just because we don't know about them doesn't mean they're not important. Those are food for all sorts of other things that we do care about, like salmon and crabs and, and uh, seabirds. And we can also say with some confidence that we are going to have more frequent and more severe heat waves in the future. So I think at some point we will look back at 2021 and think, oh, remember when it only got to 49.6 degrees in Lytton? Um, uh, and as that continues to happen, we're going to start to replace things that are native to, to the Salish Sea with things that come from other parts of the world. And it's not, you know, things that come from Oregon or California necessarily. It's things that come from, from Japan and China. Uh, and then I want to close on sort of broader lessons we've learned um, uh, through this and other heat waves. Uh, we know that species that were unlikely to suffer in the past uh, can suffer uh, very uh, significantly now. So, you know, you don't usually get hot enough to kill barnacles in this part of the world, but you can now. Um, the severity of a heat wave is not the same everywhere and where you live matters. So, um, Tatouche Island uh, in Washington was pretty unaffected. Banfield sort of in the middle. Um, Vancouver uh, or Seattle uh, really got hammered. Um, that also matters very locally. So the south side of Iraq was much hotter than the north side of Iraq. 
And sometimes you depend on other species like the rockweeds to stay cool. And we are going to see some reshuffling of where species live in the near future. And all of this, interestingly, applies to humans as well. So there are important differences between people and barnacles, but we know that humans are more likely to suffer mass uh, death from heat waves um, in warmer parts of the world now than in cooler parts. We know that um, uh, uh, the temperature during a heat wave varies on local scales, so um, uh, different neighborhoods get hotter. And a lot of that is because different neighborhoods have more or less tree cover. And we're starting to see changes in where people want to live. There are the beginnings of climate migrations in, uh, well, places like Australia, where all of a sudden Tasmania is looking really good because Sydney is getting insufferably hot. Uh, so this is a problem not just for barnacles and mussels, but for all of us, and the entire system is interconnected in, in uh, really beautiful and important ways. And so I will uh, close there, and uh, if there is time enough, hopefully there is, I can uh, field some questions. Yeah, there's time for some questions. So um, first I wanted to say there was a comment in the chat box when you said um, you sort of wish you could share the the smell of the all the mussels on the beach um, that were dead and there was a comment, please don't share the smell, <laughs> which I think we all have been on the beach and have smelled that like low tide smell of death before and I can't imagine what that would have been like. Um, so luckily that's one of those things you can't share over Zoom, <laughs> um, but thank you for sharing those videos. So um, we had a question about why the Horn of Plenty seaweed was chosen for this study versus another type of seaweed. Uh, that was um, in part because of uh, early observations I was making about why it, well, the fact that it only lived on north facing surfaces and not south facing surfaces. And I knew that that would probably be a temperature difference and it was a very sort of tractable system to work in. I was like, all right, this um, would also apply to, you know, kelps and other seaweeds that people might care a little bit more about, um, but it's just going to be really easy to work with on this one. And as luck would have it, Bob Payne had that tremendous data set, you know, decades worth of background information on that species. So we were able to sort of combine the, the, that spatial perspective with the one through time, uh, which made it a powerful way to do that. Uh, we have since then done similar things with kelps and with rockweeds and with other species um, to the point where, where one of my students took um, propane camp heaters out to a shoreline and hung them upside down from PVC frames to stimulate heat waves. And yes, those the the um, the kelp called sea cabbage hetafilum is vulnerable to that sort of thing. And that paper actually just came out this year, uh, so the timing there was was very good for people interested in heat waves. So we are looking at a variety of other uh, plants and animals too. But uh, that was done because it was a, a good system to work in to answer those questions. Great. Um, we had another question. You, I feel like at the very end you got into this a little bit, but how long does it take for these species to repopulate? Yeah, and it really does depend on the natural history of those species. And um, so for the mussels, there are enough left and they just are prolific in terms of having babies. Uh, I am expecting those to come back pretty quickly. Now, they won't be back by this winter, which is when the surf scoters arrive on, you know, the surf scoters are a sea duck that spend the summers up in the Arctic, and then they spend the winters in places like Howe Sound um, near where I live. Uh, and they eat mussels primarily, and there are going to be far fewer mussels around for them this winter. So, you know, just because the mussels are going to recover fairly quickly, probably doesn't mean that their loss won't have an impact on, on those birds this winter. But the things I worry about are some of these longer lived things. And this is one of the reasons why sea star wasting disease, which was sort of mentioned, in, uh, you know, in the, in the introduction that, that you gave, some of those uh, sea stars, like, like the, uh, the sea stars that I showed, that species is called Pisaster, that lives for 35 years or more. And I think those big sunflower stars, which are now on the critically endangered list, live for even longer than that. So when we, and, and, and by the way, sea star wasting disease is worse when it's hotter. Uh, so as we lose things like that, or like gooey ducks, or like the sea anemones that are estimated to live for 500 years, uh, it just, their cycles are so slow, the recovery is also very slow. And those are the ones that I'm especially worried about, because if we have heat waves happening 
more often than the recovery time, um, then we just never fully reset the system. And that's when we you know, tip into a new ecosystem state, which is just gonna be very different. Um, another question was, how do limpets buffer heat events? Ah, well, um, the, one of the things that limpets do is they uh, sort of clean off the rock of some of the, the microalgae, the little diatoms, and that is um, good for the barnacles. So there's all kinds of weird little connections and, and effects from one species to the next. And uh, so what really seems to have happened in that experiment was uh, the, the limpets did some favors for the barnacles, and then the barnacles have all those little, um, you know, uh, 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 wet areas in between their shells, um, which provided, you know, little refuges for other things. Um, so to be fair, there's limits to that because we saw this heat wave that was hot enough to kill even the barnacles. But um, there will be other areas uh, and other, you know, sort of species groups on the shore where keeping, you know, the whole group intact makes it more resistant. And we've seen that, you know, there's, there's experiments that have done that in prairies with plants. And there's, you know, it's sort of a growing body of evidence that suggests that keeping as many players in the game, so to speak, um, as we can has its benefits because, uh, you know, we often think of, you know, all these negative effects, oh, this got eaten or that got overgrown. There's all these positive interactions also, and the more species we keep around, the more of those positive uh, interactions we can uh, retain. The next one is maybe a little bit more of a comment, but you're welcome to comment back on it. Uh, this wasn't suggested as a solution, of course, but, um, would have been interesting to use a uh, pump to water selected stretches of barnacles and mussels for comparison. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. If we could have watered some of the barnacles and mussels, would that maybe have helped at all? Do you think? Yes. Um, I got a lot of emails from uh, the general public uh, in, you know, in the wake of all the media coverage of this. And my sort of the most touching amongst those was from a guy in California who suggested, you know, all right, it's too late for this one, but would it be possible to make shades like pop-up tents that you could get an army of volunteers to take down? So sort of the same idea of spraying water on the shore. And he said, if that were possible, I would be willing to give you um, 5,000 lineal yards of fabric for free if you can just get it to Vancouver from Willits, California. And it's like a, an amazingly generous offer and a creative potential solution. Um, but just like the idea of, you know, bringing a firefighting tugboat in to spray seawater on, there's only so much of the shoreline that you can cover if you needed that as a, like a conservation tool. So if there was a, a specific area that was incredibly high priority, like, you know, if there was a hundred meter stretch at Cherry Point, which is the only place in the world that you had a particular endangered species, then it might, might be worth having the volunteers out there with tents or umbrellas or, or fire hoses. Uh, but it's not practical at larger scales. Now, if the question was to ask, could we have used that to, you know, verify the temperature effect uh, um, as a, you know, like an experimental, you know, scientific standpoint, we actually had that. One student had put out experimental shades as part of what she was doing, didn't know there was going to be a heat wave when she established those this spring, and the barnacles under the shades did better. You, uh, we also sampled, you know, like some, uh, there was a slide uh, in your introduction that showed that sort of little pier or catwalk over the shore. We've sampled in the shady areas under those sorts of piers and the barnacles were fine there, but you walk just, you know, a few paces out into the sun and they had all died. So there, there are some, you know, little shady areas where things uh, did better just because of structures that humans have, have built or, you know, nearby trees that provide shade to the shoreline. The uh, person who put that uh, question in said that it was meant as an experiment, not as a treatment. Um, uh, yes. That was yes. really great. So we accidentally did that experiment and then, you know, nature provided us with other versions of that experiment. So yes, that was a way of, of further confirming that it was temperature and exposure to the sun that mattered quite a lot. Great. We have about five minutes and there's at least two more questions in here. Okay. Um, 
So did the data on the extent of this year's mortality of sessile organisms like mussels and barnacles have any specific impacts on policymakers in BC or the US? And me personally, I'm kind of wondering, you know, as we're putting out the draft of the Trey Point Aquatic Reserve Management Plan, like we did try to, there are things about climate change in there, but like, are there other specific things that we should include? And have other has have other policymakers been uh, moved by these events to start doing things a little bit differently? That is an excellent question. It remains to be seen. Um, I never root for this kind of catastrophe, but if it is going to happen, it's nice when it's timed ahead of, say, a big global meeting to discuss climate change and what we should do about it. So this summer. Um, having you know this type of heat wave and flooding in Europe and and uh, the you know catastrophic wildfires around the world um, uh, is helping to remind us how bad things are getting, and I'm hoping that that inspires action at these very large national and international levels. It is definitely inspiring action at um, uh, sort of more local management levels. So if you are a uh, shellfish company. This is certainly affecting how you are planning, um, you know, if you have a choice between growing your oysters on a raft where they're in the water all the time or on the beach, all of a sudden the raft is looking a lot more appealing than the beach if this sort of thing is, you know, rather than once every thousand years that you might have gotten this by chance before climate change once every five years, which is what people are, are suggesting we'll have pretty soon. Um, the, the, there are things you could do uh, as to where you would want to grow, you know, mussels or oysters or clams uh, that would make them a little bit less likely to get wiped out by this type of event. So um, when you are very self-interested because your income or your food security relies on it, then people are taking action already. When it's more of a nebulous, you know, government thing where certain countries are dragging their feet, then it may take a little longer. But hopefully we will see action at those international levels too. And I would turn it around to our audience to maybe take action and urge their policymakers to uh, move forward with uh, policy that can better protect our marine ecosystems and uh, I mean our planet in general against climate change. We got a lot of work to do. Uh, speaking of which, uh, the next question is what will be the effect of sea level rise on seashore life? And so I don't know if this was in relation to with heat waves and sea level rise that maybe, you know, there, there might be some different interactions happening there. Yes, um, and it, it depends on the shoreline habitat type. Um, so on rock, well, and it also depends on where you are. One of the uh, interesting things about Tatouche Island uh, out on the tip of the Olympic Peninsula is um, it's getting shoved up out of the water by tectonic processes and glacial rebound faster than sea level rise. So relative sea level change out in Nia Bay is actually a drop. Um, but uh, those rocky shore systems, you know, that's uh, millimeters a year in change. And those systems can keep up because, you know, every year there's a new generation of barnacles and mussels that come in. And, you know, snails can crawl faster than a few millimeters a year. Uh, so rocky shores will probably be um, fine. It's areas where you have something like uh, an eelgrass bed or salt marsh or mud flat, which is, you know, really broad and gently sloping and it ends in a seawall because you have somebody's yard or you have, you know, some other coastal infrastructure that's protected. Um, when you have sea level rise in that situation, the, the marsh or the eelgrass can't migrate inland and it gets trapped there and drowned. So those are the habitats that I'm really worried about for, for sea level rise is, uh, you know, a lot of um, the, the coastline between uh, where I am and where you are is armored in that way. And so we might lose a lot of eelgrass in places like the Padilla Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve just because it can't migrate inland to keep up with that, um, that sea level rise. So that is going to require some creative management strategies. And it could be that there need to be some, you know, shifts in land use. It's like, well, you know what, that's going to have to, if we want to keep the migratory birds uh, happy, we might not have this as a farm. We might break the dikes and levees in this area and let that be the eelgrass bed of the 2030s. And we have just one minute left and one more question. Um, have any of these species been stress tested in the lab? Questionably ethical example, leaving a rock weed under a heat lamp at various temperatures. 
Yes, we have. And it's one of the advantages of working on something that's not fish or, you know, uh, uh, animals where uh, a lot of research ethics things uh, do apply uh, very directly. And it's not that we, you know, go out and slaughter barnacles for fun, uh, but we do uh, work to figure out what their tolerance limits are in the lab so that we can understand what's happening in the field. So we've done that for barnacles and for mussels to answer questions like if they get exposed to a, a stress event that doesn't kill them, does that make them better able to handle the next one? Because they basically gear up their um, physiology to be ready. Um, and uh, the answer is yes. If you have muscles that are used to it being hot, they can handle about a degree and a half more of, of, uh, of heat wave stress than animals that weren't ready for that. Uh, so we do do that. We try to be as responsible as we can uh, and use the smallest number of, of animals that we need to answer the question. But yes, that is something that we do. Great. Well, thank you so much. I, I know I really appreciated your presentation and has me thinking a lot about like when we're doing our intertidal surveys and marine bird surveys and sea star surveys and other stuff, uh, maybe what other information we could be collecting out there. It didn't seem like when we were out on the beach this summer that uh, the Cherry Point area got too, too impacted by that heat wave. It definitely was hot out there for sure. Um, we were actually out doing sea star surveys during some of it, um, but, and it seemed like they were kind of hiding um, like you were mentioning, but uh, I would love to follow up with some conversations on what we might be able to do better to help uh, support some of your research or uh, figure out what's going on so we can better uh, protect the aquatic reserve. And with that, um, we're going to take a five minute break. Casey, don't worry, we're not going to cut into the time uh, for your, your presentation. You can go over by a little bit. And um, I will put up a, a slide, show, slide deck that uh, has a timer so that We'll meet back at 1127, but you'll see the, the countdown happening on the screen. So thanks everyone and see you soon. Thanks so much, Chris. Looking forward to your talk, Casey.
All right, it's time to get started again. I really quickly wanted to bring your or bring folks' attention to there was a question asked um, during the break about when the deadline for comments for the Cherry Point draft plan um, are. And to my knowledge, there's no exact deadline, but the sooner the better. I think by the end of this month would be ideal, or November, sorry, not the end of October, it's still October, um, by the end of not November, because there's a Cherry Point Implementation Committee meeting. And Erica Blakey from DNR, if you want to respond differently in the chat box, if you have better information than that, please do. And so uh, let's get started again. Um, we're going to have Robert, or sorry, Lyle Anderson, also from the Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Stewardship Committee, who's going to introduce our speaker, Casey. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, Casey McLean is the executive director and veterinary nurse at Sea Life Response, Rehabilitation, and Research or SR3. Casey is a licensed veterinary technician with a degree in marine biology and has over 12 years experience in marine animal care, rehabilitation and conservation. She's also an active member of the Marine Mammal Stranding Network, caring for seal pups, sea otters, sea lions, while her work with SR3 involves disentangling sea lions and large whales for marine debris studying cetacean health with an emphasis on resident killer whales and working with tribes and other communities to support wildlife health and community involvement. And uh, on a personal note, I would say, I would like to say that uh, I am a retired veterinary technician, um, last job I had before retirement. And uh, when I, graduated from the veterinary technician courses. Um, I looked all up and down the West Coast for uh, a uh, wildlife rehabilitation program um, and couldn't find one. So I'm very envious of Casey for creating her own position like this. Casey? Thanks, Lyle. I appreciate that. Yeah, I have to admit, when I moved here, I was quite surprised I couldn't find anything either. And um, yeah, it's been a long journey. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about that as I get started here. I'm going to share my screen. All right, is that in full screen mode for everybody? Lyle, if you can tell me about look good. Looks great. Looks great. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm always excited to talk to anybody who will listen to me about <laughs> marine wildlife and kind of what's going on around the Salish Sea. And as mentioned, I am a co-founder, executive director, and a veterinary nurse for SR3. We are a very small organization, so we wear a lot of us wear many hats. But it's a nonprofit organization that was founded back in 2011, and we just recently opened a marine animal hospital in the Des Moines Marina. So that's where we're based out of, but we do work uh, throughout the Salish Sea. And our mission is to promote the health and welfare of marine wildlife in the Pacific Northwest, as you can see there on the screen. And I'm not a Pacific Northwest native. I moved from the East Coast in 2010, and originally the San Juan Islands um, from Key West, which was also not my original home, but uh, where I was studying sea turtles. And so I moved up to the Pacific Northwest and San Juans loved it, but I was also quite shocked that in a place where everyone is so environmentally conscious and there's this huge abundance of marine wildlife, that there wasn't a hospital that was specifically dedicated to helping marine mammals and sea turtles. And that is a very common thing throughout the rest of the country. So it was a little bit shocking to me. I can't say that I was uh, immediately like, oh, let me <laughs> step right in and, and see what we can do to fix this problem. But over the years, uh, myself and other co-founders and colleagues have worked really hard to make this um, facility and this organization come to life. So I'm excited to share a little bit about it with you. I think that, you know, as I, as I listened to the previous presentation, there's no lack of evidence of climate change and the fact that our marine wildlife are facing tremendous challenges when it comes to their health and their welfare in the marine, um, in the Salish Sea. These are just a few examples 
you know, we were just talking about the nearshore ecosystems and the huge amount of die off that happened due to the, the heat wave. We're also seeing things like beluga whales in Puget Sound, which is incredibly unusual. We still don't know why that animal was here. He is not, he or she has not been seen in quite some time. Um, but these are just animals that are out of their natural habitat. And there's typically always going to be a reason for that, whether we may discover what it is or not is a different story. We're also seeing fur seals, that's this little guy in the lower left-hand corner here, that are showing up along our shorelines, emaciated and starving, just unable to find the food they need. Over the past couple of years, we've had gray whale uh, events, increase in mortality events for those animals due to a lack of food in the Bering Sea. And we're even seeing things like huge increases of cancer cases with seals and sea lions. So all of this, of course, is very distressing. Uh, it is capturing people's attention as we were just talking about, you know, the public reaching out and saying, what can we do and how can we help? And I, I like that it's capturing people's attention and the, the concern is growing. What I hope we can do is take our instinct to want to rescue and address, <laughs> no pun intended, the immediate fire right in front of us, but channel that into what kind of changes can we make in our daily lives to actually help not only marine mammals, but also the entire ecosystem. And that is something that SR3 really tries to focus on is the fact that sometimes it can be hard to get people to care about mussels or fish or seaweed, but I often find it fairly easy to get people to care about a gray whale or a harbor seal. So if we can get people to make changes to help those animals, it's going to help the ecosystem as a whole and eventually us as well, since human health is so connected to it. But I think we have to listen to what are the animals telling us? You know, these, these are all clues that are coming to us. It's not something for us to just kind of say, oh, well, that's interesting. This is, it's a chance for us to learn. And marine mammals in particular, they help us monitor ocean health. Think of it kind of like this, you know, vitals monitor that you see here with all this information on it as to what's going on with these animals. And so that's why it's really important for us to be paying attention and responding to these events. And in the last presentation where it talked about uh, the gentleman that had been reporting where the um, growth had been for 15 years, that may sound like very boring science or very basic, but that data was critical when something happened. So, or when things change. So I think that's a big part of what we do as well. It's just that continuous monitoring of how are things going out there. And with marine mammals, especially if they're not on the shore, out of sight can be out of mind and we don't really know what's happening. People may not notice if a lot of commercially unimportant fish start dying off, but you'll certainly notice if all of a sudden we have 30 dead gray whales on our shorelines. So it's really a way for us to understand what's going on down that food chain as well. And if we're not helping these animals now, when things like um, over here, this oil spill you see, when crises happen, we aren't prepared to help them. You know, Marine Mammal Hospital is not something that you can just pop up overnight. It takes a lot of construction to be able to have the right filtration systems and things that can hold these animals to be able to help them during these crisis moments. So at that point, it's too late for us to catch up. So being prepared in advance is really critical. One thing you might not know uh, is that we only see about 1% of the marine animals that are dying out in the ocean on our shorelines. So it's a really tiny percent of animals that we're going to see or even get the chance to potentially help or learn from. Another reason it's so critical to be paying close attention. We, of course, are not the only kid on the block. We're one of the a um, small piece of this pie of all of these wonderful people that are working on this. These are just some of the groups that we have partnered with and continue to partner with. There are many others, of course, but the problem is so big that no one organization can solve this. And partnership is really critical to the success um, of all of us reaching the goal of improving the health of the Salish Sea. But what all of us are seeing are some of these common top threats. And it does boil down to kind of these three major categories when it comes to marine mammals. And the three main things we see, emaciation, disease, and human interaction. And a lot of these are linked. I don't want to make it seem simple um, because there are multifaceted things that are here. So for example, 
with human interaction, you could be talking about boat strikes, gunshots, dog attacks. You could even potentially be talking about what we term pup napping, where someone saw Harbor Seal pup, they thought it was in distress, they made the decision to pick up that animal and take it home, even though in reality it was okay. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with public education of how do we share our shore with these animals. So there's all kinds of things that can fall into that category. Sometimes it can be people literally just being too close to a pup on a beach. That means mom won't come back for that animal. Disease and emaciation, of course, there are many factors that can lead to that from toxins, contaminants, climate change, as we've been talking about, habitat destruction and overfishing, of course, can lead to the emaciation. So again, by no means am I saying it's simplified down to just these three categories or, oh, if we could just fix these three things, we'd be all good. It's quite complex, of course. And when we see an animal on the beach, like you see this one here, sometimes the reason for stranding isn't evident. You know, this animal, we didn't see any gunshot wounds. Of course, we couldn't see any um, immediate answers of what disease might be harming him. Um, so rehabilitation and responding to these animals on the beach, even if it means performing a necropsy if they have passed away, which is like an autopsy, that's where we get the information of what is actually affecting them and what's going on out in our oceans. And a lot of these things change rapidly. So something that we were seeing two or three years ago, one might significantly increase or two may completely disappear. So when we had the warm water blob, for instance, we were seeing a heavy increase in parasite loads. Well, the warm water blob is now gone or only in certain areas for right now. So we're seeing less of that. It's why it's just really important for that continual monitoring. And that's what a rehabilitation facility really is there for. You aren't so much, uh, we might be focused on helping that individual, but we're really looking for what are these bigger themes or what are these bigger consistent patterns that we're seeing and how can we help policymakers address that. The numbers of strandings, which is an animal that is either out of habitat, such as that beluga that is considered a stranding, um, on the beach, unable to return to the water, or um, I think I said that, out of habitat. <laughs> so stranding numbers have continued to increase Basically since the 90s, there's been lots of fluctuation, but the overall trend has been up in the Pacific Northwest. And part of that is because there's more people. And that means that there's more eyeballs on the beaches. So a lot of our beaches that previously had very few people on it have lots of people now. And where there's more people, there's more reporting. So there's a little bit of that factor going on. And we also have an increase in animal population. So back in the 60s, Seals and sea lions were hunted almost to extinction in this area, and their populations are now back to where they were back in the before pre-hunting times. So we have these healthy populations, so inevitably we're going to see more of these animals along our shorelines, which means that we're often going to see the cases that are not doing so well. And of course, I think just the general concern and understanding of the importance of the marine mammals' role in our ecosystem has increased since that time frame. So there's just more people that are paying attention to this. So what happens when these animals are on the beaches? We have a wonderful straining network throughout the entire um, Pacific Northwest, actually the whole entire West Coast, of course. But this map kind of shows you what you're looking at on the, the inland waters here. There's quite a few different groups. Many of them are all volunteer. So you may not get someone who answers the phone immediately. But if you call this network hotline number over here to the left, that no matter where you are, that will get the message to the correct group and you will be able to talk to um, a person right then and there who will take all the information and make sure we know um, what's going on before they send someone out to respond to this. So a lot of calls that come in, it might just be an animal who is resting on the beach and who really doesn't need any help. So it's really important that you utilize these resources and talk to these folks because they are very experienced in determining is this an animal that really needs help or is it just napping or um, thermoregulating even. We get lots of calls about sea lions with their um, flippers sticking out of the water this time of year. And those animals are really just uh, either heating up or cooling down their body temperature. So these guys are your first responders. And then what happens is they call us if they need additional support or they need our expertise or something. 
certainly if you are out somewhere and you can't find this phone number and you find SR3's number, of course you can call us and we can help direct you as well. So the stranding network is really busy during pupping season. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this because this is the animal you're most likely to encounter um, on the beach, certainly, but even in our local inland waters, harbor seals are the most abundant pinniped we have around, pinniped being a seal or a sea lion. So what's interesting is that pupping kind of starts mid-April down here around the, the lower, um, you know, south of Grays Harbor, We'll start seeing pups. California starts even earlier and it just kind of makes its way up the west coast here and then around and then down into the sound the later in the summer that it gets. So SR3 responds to animals all over the entire Pacific Northwest. So we find ourselves out along the coast um, or helping other groups out along the coast frequently earlier in the season and then focusing more on inland waters as it gets later. Harbor seals give birth to one pup per year. And this map, I think, is great to just kind of understand when you might be seeing pups. And the harbor seals are super skittish adults, which is how they should be. They are prey animals, so they tend to be on high alert for anything that could be considered a threat. And while we might think we're just, you know, hanging out on the beach watching them, humans and dogs are a threat. So if, um, and kayakers, if kayakers get too close to a haul out, it's very easy to flush all of those animals because if one harbor seal gets scared, they all get scared. <laughs> Same. So they'll all go rushing into the water. And that can be an easy way to separate moms and pups. Uh, pups could be swept away in the currents, then cause that separation. So it's really important to be very cautious around these areas uh, if you are out on the water. If you see a pup on the beach, remaining as far away as you possibly can is really important as well. They are only with their pups for four to six weeks. So it's a very short time period to get this creature fat enough to survive on its own and also teach it pretty much everything you know in a very short time. The harbor seals, a lot of their hunting and what they do is pretty instinctual, but they spend a lot of time with mom. So it's not common for harbor seal pups to be left for longer than a few hours to maybe 24 hours. They're not going to leave their pup on the beach for days and days and not come back. Now, that doesn't mean that she might be nursing that pup at a time you did not see that happening. But of course, if that animal, you're watching them and they continue to get thinner and thinner and weaker and weaker, then you know she has not been back. That, that during this four to six week period, they're going to double their body weight. The milk they're nursing on is about 50% fat. So they go from tiny little things to pretty much little sausage balls before they are weaned. And it is what we call a hard wean. She just one day says, you're done. Good luck, kid. Have a nice life out there. And that's it. So there's no um, prolonged coming back and forth period. And then the pup is just on its own to figure out how to feed itself. So if it's only four to six weeks and they're born in June, you're starting to see weaned pups in you know, late July, even mid-July and August. And they can look really tiny and helpless and seem like they need our help. But in reality, the water's just really cold. They're exhausted from trying to learn how to fend for themselves. And so they come up on the beach to take a nap. And studies have proven, as I mentioned, that they really just don't spend much time apart during this uh, pre-weaning time when they're still nursing. You'll notice they go nose to nose like this. The animals have scent glands, and this is how they recognize each other. Now, harbor seal pups are naturally attracted to objects bigger than themselves. So if you've ever been out kayaking or you've been in a marina and people are like, oh my gosh, it's following the boat or it's following the kayak, it's kind of a natural instinct for them to follow a larger object. Mom is almost always close by and watching. So again, staying far, far away from these guys to give them the best chance at survival as possible is really important. I always tell people, if you see a pup on the beach, please remain calm. Not all these babies need help. And again, they could just be taking a nap or mom's gonna be back very shortly as long as people and dogs are back away. There's that hotline number. Again, I encourage all of you to have this in your phones if you're a beach walker or spend a lot of time out on the water. And the best thing you can do, of course, is to stay back, take some photos or video from a distance. It helps us uh, kind of see what's going on. And then, you know, correspond with the responders and see 
uh, if this animal truly does need help, or maybe if you're in an area like Altai Beach, there's a group called seal sitters, maybe they just need to come out and help uh, keep crowds back to give that animal some space. Some things you can look for if you are observing harbor seals, some uh, calls we get regularly during the season. Uh, remember these are mammals, they do have umbilical cords. So that's what you're seeing here in this top left picture. We get calls about intestines hanging out or you know, bloody injuries, when in reality, they're going to have this fleshy umbilical cord. There's no nurse there to cut it off and tie it into a nice little belly button. So that's there for maybe seven to 10 days. Um, and you can see this animal is quite alert, looking a little thin. Here you can see some hips, but uh, could just be waiting on mom. Now this guy in the lower corner here, this animal is extremely thin. Uh, obviously I can't tell whether this is a weaned pup or not. It would just depend on the time of year. But this would be an animal you would want to call um, the hotline about and say, hey, this really skinny animal here seems to be struggling and have those responders come out and take a look to see what's going on. I don't know if you guys have ever seen elephant seals before, but we're starting to see more and more of them in our area, which is kind of exciting. They used to be in the Puget Sound and they were hunted out, and now we're starting to see some returning. There's, in fact, one elephant seal um, who is single handedly <laughs> repopulating with the island, it seems like. So she has a, a pup every other year, every couple of years over there, which is pretty fun to see. And we are getting them coming up from California as well. Sometimes they show up and they look like this, and that is extremely distressing to most people because elephant seals go through something called a catastrophic molt, which means that they don't just lose their fur like harbor seals do, they actually lose their top layer of skin. And it's, it looks quite disgusting. It can become bloody, it can become infected. So, but this is a, a normal molt here. Their eyes get really goopy. They lose almost 50% of their body weight during this time. They tend to stay on the beach for most of that time period. And so this, this animal was not in good, looking good condition here. So something you'd want to call in for sure, just so people are, we can be aware of where that animal is showing up, but it might be something that is their natural process, but we'd wanna check and see how they're doing. You can also watch for things like coughing. This time of year as harbor seal pups are already weaned, they should be on their own, but looking for things like coughing or green or yellow discharge from the nose, the ears, their eyes uh, is kind of something that would be important to note to um, let responders know if you're calling in. I always recommend all of that stuff is observed through binoculars so you're not getting too close to these animals and take photos from a distance uh, as much as you can. Well, other things to look for. So this guy here on the right, um, you can see the hip bones are kind of protruding here and it's, it looked pretty kind of cold depending on what the weather was doing that day, but you can see these injuries on the flipper as well. So injuries can be really tricky, especially on harbor seals, depending on what way they're laying, you might not see a, an injury until they move. Um, also, sometimes injuries are just really well hidden by their fur, particularly dog bites, because they tend to be punctured. You might just see a little bloody spot on the fur, or you may see nothing. But if that animal has been hanging around for a couple of days, isn't really moving from that spot and seems to be uh, not doing so well, then you would obviously want to make sure you let the stranding network know about that. This animal in the top left corner here, that's a pretty healthy looking harbor seal. Um, hard to tell the body condition from this angle, but we had several other pictures of it. it. was quite round. You shouldn't be able to see ribs. You shouldn't be able to see spine or hips. They should be rather sausage-like with just a head. You can also see these really nice eye rings around their eyes here. As they haul out the animals uh, that are well hydrated will have these eye rings. This little guy here is one that came into our facility earlier this season. And what I wanted to point out here is you see this white fluffy fur on its back. That's what's called lanugo, and that indicated that this animal had been born prematurely. They typically shed all of this fur in utero, so they should come out more with that sleek, silvery spotted looking, kind of like this guy over here, um, versus this little fluffy creature. Uh, lanugo pups in particular need their space and quiet and rest on these beaches. But think of it like a, a NICU baby. You know, they've, they've got some more 
growing to do, maybe their lungs aren't fully developed, they're going to need more time to rest. Sometimes these animals might be born to new moms that really don't know what they're doing and they may not make it. Other times it might be a pretty good mom, but the animal picked a, a poor beach to take a nap on that was just very busy. Uh, Lanuga pups can be rehabilitated. They seem to do quite well throughout the country. These animals are um, in rehabilitation facilities, but of course, if they sometimes they don't make it if they're um, left alone for too long or they just don't develop correctly. A few other things you might see out in the field and wonder if that's normal. Uh, we get some phone calls on these things as well. So sea, sea lions are branded in various parts of the country, particularly in Alaska, some down in Oregon around um, the dams, depending on what they're looking for. Now this is a very fresh brand. We don't tend to see those as much around here, but once this peels over, seeing a large number on an animal is something that we would recommend you report. We do like to know where these animals are going. The researchers, uh, if that's valuable data for them. So they're branded when they're very young pups, and this is a stellar sea lion, and this is a way for them to know when are we losing these animals in the life cycle? Are they mostly dying as pups? Are we seeing them as young adults or as adults? That's what that purpose of that is for. This little guy was one that we get phone calls that I think the best phone call I've ever gotten was a lady who was extremely upset that someone had taped a cell phone to the harbor seal. Um, she wasn't close enough to really see exactly what that was, but this is a satellite tracker. And we do occasionally put these on harbor seals. Uh, Wapalo and the San Juans may also put them on there. They do harbor seal rehabilitation as well. Um, so it might be something that you would see in the area. This does come off when the harbor seal molts and they molt once a year. So that just falls right off. So it won't be on them for life or anything like that. But it is a way for us to help have a better understanding of where these animals are going when they're released. Um, and it's usually only, the batteries are only good for about a year. So that's about the most data you can get out of that. Couple other things to look for that are important. Uh, every rehabilitated animal will get one of these little orange flipper tags. You can see in this top left corner um, on the rear flipper. Uh, the females get one on the right because you can guess, ladies are always right. And then the males will get one on the left. Just an easy way for us to remember that. But the sea lions will have these on their front flippers, kind of around their armpit area. Harbor seals will have them on the back. Do not get close enough to read that number, please, <laughs> unless you have, you know, use your binoculars or a spotting scope or something. But if you get one of those numbers, or if there's a dead animal with one of these tags, please do report that. That is very uh, valuable information for us. These do not fall off. They are pierced through the webbing of the flippers back here, much like an earring. And unless a predator or gets hung on something which doesn't happen very often, um, and it pulls out, these stay on them for life. These adorable little hats here. <laughs> this is something that actually you guys might see. Wolf Hollow puts these on. Um, they can only rehabilitate a few harbor seals, but they do put these on the ones that they release. And they're little wooden hat tags. And it's just a way to do short-term reciting of animals that they have released. So if you see one of those, again, please use your binoculars or spotting scope and let, um, let them know or let the stranding network know and they can get the information to them. That's really important data. We often wonder if they, we put these on and they go out and the other seals are <laughs> curious about their, um, I guess I'll call it their bling. So the way that SR3 addresses a lot of these threats that we've been talking about is through our three R's. That's where our name came from. We do response, um, rehabilitation, and research. So that means that for responding, we are ready 365 days a year to go out into the field, whether that's an entangled sea lion, an entangled whale, um, a harbor seal on the beach that needs picking up or a health assessment. We're ready for all of that. We do have an ambulance, so you might see us on the road with that at some point, that we use to transport animals. And the ambulance is pretty critical because sometimes we're traveling four and five hours. Before we had the hospital, we actually transported a few animals um, that were uh, threatened and endangered species down to California, which is a 15 hour drive. So having the ability to provide medical care en route, to 
do things like x-rays or ultrasounds if we needed to in the back of the ambulance to um, control temperature and just have a, a safer ride than if we were in the back of a pickup truck is pretty crucial to what we do. We're going to talk a little bit about the hospital shortly, but of course we do provide rehabilitation for marine mammals. Um, so specialty medical care from people who have training specifically with marine mammals. And then our research program is highly focused on our southern residents, but also a lot of other species. And the goal here is to provide data to actually influence and change policies that need to change to protect these animals. And again, everything we do is because these animals are sentinels of the marine ecosystem. So they're really telling us about the health of the ocean overall. So this is our facility and we opened in April. Um, it took us about a year. We, we started construction right before COVID. So it was a little unfortunate, but we powered through and we were able to, to get everything up and running in, by April, which was right before the main pupping season. So it was good timing, um, although a little stressful. We are located in the Des Moines Marina and we have two outdoor pools a 12 by four and an eight by four. And then underneath this white tent, which you can't see here are 12, um, I'll call them totes. They're basically smaller squares that harbor seals or other small pinnipeds can go into when they first come into the hospital and they're in more critical condition. The tent allows us to provide temperature control, um, things like heat lamps at night. They also do swim in these totes. And then once they're strong enough, they actually get to go outside to the bigger pools where they'll be gaining muscle mass and gaining weight and learning how to compete with their poolmates before they go back out to the ocean. Now the building you see here in the lower picture, this is where we have a couple of offices, we have our food prep kitchen, and we have our surgical and treatment suite. And I'll give you a, an inside look at that in just a minute. You can see our little ambulance here. It almost looks like a little toy in this drone picture. So it's about a 14,000 square foot space. It's not giant, but it's a great start because prior to this, there wasn't, a lot of these animals just didn't have anywhere to go or we had very limited resources for even harbor sales, only a few to go to rehab. Um, so this is really providing additional resources, but also filling some gaps for things that we couldn't do previously. And again, we are available 24 seven for these animals. So. Here in the summer, there's pretty much somebody here almost at all hours. And in the winter, we kind of uh, winterize a little bit and it'll just be available as these different animals come in that need help. Um, winter time, we tend to see different species. And of course, there's fewer people out on the beaches. So less animals are being reported. And again, the whole point of rehabilitation for uh, SR3, our main focus is that yes, we're helping these individuals, but we're gaining a better understanding of what is affecting the ocean as a whole and how can we help all of the wild animals that are still out there? What changes can we um, help people make so that the ocean is protected and more of these animals are protected? So this is inside our surgical seat here on the left-hand side. These pictures are a little, little older. We've made lots of changes over the summer, but you can see this is our most cooperative patient <laughs> that poses for all of our photos. And uh, you see our table here, we have a full anesthesia set up. We do surgeries. We have a full-time marine mammal veterinarian um, who, who has done this work for many years. So we can do any kind of surgery they need from things like um, eye inoculations, that does happen sometimes. Um, if you need to amputate a flipper or repair a bone, all of those sorts of things we're able to do at this facility. We also can do things like ultrasounds. You can see um, our doctor, Frank Berger here performing one of those on this little pup. And we have a mobile x-ray machine. So most of our equipment is mobile. We may have to do it in this room or we may actually do it out with the pools because we can take animals that are several thousand pounds in weight. So moving those animals around is not convenient. So we go to them, of course. Our mobile x-ray system is also pretty important because we can do x-rays out in the field, which this time of year, we start to see a lot of gunshot victims. And while most of those animals are already deceased, an x-ray can actually help us gather the evidence and data that we need to report on that. So much like you would think of your veterinary clinic for 
cats and dogs, we have all of that same sort of stuff. We had a really successful first season. We've had 35 cases come through our doors since January 1st, and the vast majority of those being harbor seals since our hospital opened in April and pupping season started just almost within a few weeks of that. Um, this winter, we'll expect to see some different species, but for right now, most of our patients have been used harbor seals. We have released 18 so far. We have a few more to go, of course. You know, it's wildlife rehab, so not all of them survive. Some of them we did have to euthanize due to um, developmental problems as far as um, like one had a GI problem that just didn't develop correctly. And we don't know why. Um, so sometimes those things do happen as part of wildlife rehab, but we're really thrilled that we've been able to give so many animals a second chance. Almost all of them that come through our doors uh, have been impacted by humans, whether that's being picked up illegally. We did have several of those this year. Uh, dog attacks are quite um, frequent, something that we see, and people just being too close and mom getting scared off. They come to us from all over the Pacific Northwest, so everything from Ocean Shores to Bellingham to Port Angeles, Olympia, really anywhere in the region. Um, and that's all those stranding network responders that are checking on these animals and helping get them to the hospital. So I mentioned we'll be able to see other types of animals. So now we're gonna be able to provide 10 different species with opportunity for care should they need it. Whereas in the past, really, we've only been able to provide harbor seal rehabilitation in the Pacific Northwest for very limited numbers of seals. This is really opening up the doors um, to be able to help a lot of different animals. Everything from tiny harbor seal pups all the way up to several thousand pound sea lions, sea turtles, not a marine mammal, but still <laughs> marine wildlife. And right now is the time where sea turtles may start showing up on our shorelines along the outer coast in southern Washington, northern Oregon area. In fact, there have already been at least two that I've known about within the past few weeks. And these sea turtles are following the warm water currents up the coast from California. They get blown into our cold near shore waters out of that warm water current and they get cold stunned. Um, limp, limp noodle turtle. It is a life or death emergency for them since they like their water, they need their water to be about 70 to 80 degrees. And our coastal waters, if you've ever stuck a toe in it, you know they're not 70 to 80 degrees, they're about 55 to 60. So sea otters and small porpoises and dolphins would also be able to come to the hospital as well. We rely on the community. If I'm doing on time here. We rely on the community quite heavily. Um, we're about 20% staff with about 80% volunteers. And this really provides a unique opportunity, not only for students, but also for anyone interested in working in the conservation field or really just feeling like they're making a direct impact. Um, we have about 150 active volunteers right now. We were able to give seven interns um, a very unique opportunity. They, previously you would not have been able to have in the Pacific Northwest. So we were pretty excited about that. And this lower corner here, this is a um, ophthalmologist from the region who specializes in just eyeball cases. So we called him in. Uh, he has done some work with marine mammals, but was really excited to be able to partner with us to do this work. And they, most of these specialists that we work with are kind enough to actually donate their services as well. So it's pretty, Again, it's just heavily community involvement and it's a unique opportunity for everybody. Of course, outside of our walls, we want the community engaged as well. I mentioned earlier that getting people to understand that yes, we wanna respond in a crisis, but we also wanna try and make those everyday changes in our own lives and also as groups doing things like beach cleanups and stuff like that, that will really help out the environment uh, in the long run as a whole. So we do quite a, at least two to three beach cleanups a year pre-COVID. We're typically involved in about 60 different community events or presentations a year. And we try and work with small groups like Girl Scout groups, um, some small sc school groups. Unfortunately, at the facility, we can't have large groups come through because we don't have a way to kind of um, have that distance viewing. And these animals do have to go back out to the wild. So we aren't open to the public to just wander through it could cause these animals to become too used to humans and then 
they may unfortunately go out to humans in the wild, which can be pretty dangerous. So uh, a lot of this is the outreach that we try and do out in the community. Uh, other things that we do outside of our walls, whale and dolphin health research. This is Dr. Holly Fernbach. We do this with a lot of different species. I'll show you other pictures, but obviously we have a strong focus on southern resident killer whales. And maybe you've seen this research in the news as well. We partner with Dr. John Durbin and several other groups as well, um, collaborating our data with these folks to really make a difference for the southern residents. All of this is done by drone. We want to stay as far away from the whales as we possibly can while still gathering this really important data. And what's happening here is the drone is flying high above the animals and we're getting these really detailed images to do body measurements. So we can tell who's gaining weight, who's losing weight. Uh, we can measure calf growth rates. So much like when you take your child to the doctor and they tell you what percentile they're in, we can see how are these calves growing and is it normal? Um, pregnancy can be detected earlier, which is really important. If, if these whales go away you know, during the winter and we had no idea they were pregnant and they show back up and they still don't have a calf, we never knew. So we're not counting that as a loss to the population. But if we knew they were pregnant and they showed back up without a baby, then we know that was some some, a loss to the population. Either that animal um, did not survive uh, birth or was stillborn or you know, maybe was attacked, we don't know. But we can still count it as a loss to the population. As I mentioned, we do this with other species as well. So humpback whales, gray whales. Um, we partnered with Cascadia Research Collective to do some studies on our Puget Sounder gray whales just this past year. Uh, we also look at killer whales in Antarctica, bottlenose dolphins in California, and even harbor seals. If you can't tell what these little <laughs> slugs on seaweed are down here in the left corner, those are harbor seals. And so it's not just sun and resonance, but that is a, a strong focus of ours. And basically this allows us to collect data and samples with staying very far away. Now we can't use the snot bot, <laughs> this is what most people know it as, but the drone that collects the blow as the animal comes up. We don't use that on southern residents, but we do that with humpback whales, gray whales, other types of baleen whales. Uh, you know, killer whales are dolphins, so they're really attuned to the presence of this thing if it gets too low. It's very expensive equipment, and they can easily knock it out of the air. So it, it has not been worth the risk <laughs> to us to be able to collect that uh, type of sample from that way. Now I know NOAA does collect blow samples from Southern residents using a, a very long pole and getting a little bit closer to them, obviously. We can also watch observations. This is a humpback whale bubble net group in Alaska. And what was really interesting about this is working with the researchers that knew these whales as individuals, they were able to tell that these animals actually feed in a very specific pattern. So the matriarch gets to go first and then there's there's almost a, a hierarchy of how they can feed and how they work together in these bubble nets. So really interesting information by being able to stay far enough away from the animals that they don't know we're there. We are increasing the types of information we're getting from the drones this year. We're looking at um, doing some other measurements, looking at skin sample, uh, looking at skin condition, and potentially we could even get to the point where maybe we could take a temperature from a whale um, from a drone. We'll see. And a lot of people think, oh, this works great. Oh my gosh, these are gorgeous photos, which they are. But of course, the whole point behind this is to get people who don't live on the Salish Sea invested in what's going on with these killer whales. I think it's gonna take more than just the folks that live around the Salish Sea and that are in this region to care about this because their numbers are continuing to decline. So again, it's that piece of what can I do from a distance that's actually gonna help the ocean as a whole and help these whales. So directly informing um, policies is a big deal to us. Getting that information out, this was in the Washington Post. So that's pretty cool to reach different um, populations of people that may have never even seen these whales. Sorry about that. A little more about whales. We also respond to entangled whales and some studies, we know that 70% of whales have been entangled at some point in their life. That doesn't mean that 70% of whales are dying 
because of entanglement. It just means that by looking at scars, and we look at scars along the flukes down here, the um, leading edge as it comes in and the trailing edge here, you can see where these lines are wrapped. Those leave scars if the animal is able to get out of it or is freed. And we can study those scar patterns to know probably how many times they have been entangled. And of course, pinnipeds are getting entangled as well. You can see this fishing hook here for the lower jaw of this guy that we um, rescued last year. And then this around this animal's neck, we were able to cut this packing band free and uh, set him free. So pinnipeds are typically dealing with debris, whereas large whales are dealing with active fishing gear, not ghost gear. A lot of people think, oh, it's all the ghost gear in the water. And it's actually actively set fishing gear. Not that it's being set illegally. Um, fishermen don't want whales caught in their gear. They don't want to lose their gear. They're trying to fish. They're not fishing for whales. So it's not an advantage to anyone, of course. And we do work closely with fishermen and the fishing industry to figure out how are these whales getting entangled and what can we do to prevent this? So even things like doing surveys before a crab fishery opens, um, our team will go out and look to see how many whales are in that area and potentially if the crabbing industry should delay their opening until the whales move out of that area to prevent this. So there's lots of work going on with that. Again, the seals and felines, typically it's debris, so it is trash, often these packing straps from bait boxes. And these things have such strong glue, they're not cut, um, they're just, they slide them off the box and they wind up in the water. And the glue that holds the two ends together is so strong that these animals get it around their neck when they're young and they grow into it. Um, that glue can last for many, many, many years. So working with industries to find out maybe there's a different type of glue we can use. Maybe there's a biodegradable packing strap that would work. Because even if these straps are cut off the sea lions or if they fall off, et cetera, um, they're still in the water creating microplastics, of course, which is a problem for all the other marine life as well. And as far as, am I still doing okay on time? I think so. Yeah, you're doing okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> As far as entangled whales out there, if you should see an entangled whale, what should you do? A lot of times when you're out on the water and boating, this might be all you see. It's just a little orange thing floating kind of far or off to the side behind the whale. It can be really hard to tell if they're actually entangled. Many entangled whales continue to move um, through the water even quickly sometimes. They may not raise their tail as they normally do when they dive. But people may not recognize that as a problem. You might just see this orange thing that seems to be following the whale around. But what you don't see is what's going on underneath the water. And this is where it gets dangerous. Um, people see the orange buoy and they want to come up close to it and just cut that off and think that, oh, okay, we've saved the whale. That's great. But it's usually always some sort of circular wrap. It can be through their baleen, which makes it very tight and hard to remove. So it's a really complicated thing under here. And it's why we always recommend that people don't do any sort of approaching a whale that has trailing gear. You can get your boat, um, your props caught up in that, which is bad for you and of course terrifying for the whale. Um, and just getting close to these animals, they are stressed, so that can increase their stress as well. So we have a lot of different specialized gear that we use to remove this sort of entanglement. There's underwater video that we take. There's lots of, there's a team of five or six people that work on this. So it's, it's really not as simple as YouTube would like us to think it is sometimes. So we recommend that you stay far away, take those pictures and video as much as you can and report it immediately. Part of the problem we have in the Pacific Northwest is that we have a, a huge coastline and often these whales are spotted pretty far offshore. So somebody might wait to report that whale until they get back to the marina. And while we're, we're good at finding whales, we're, it's really hard to find that specific whale again. Uh, whales can travel 100 miles a day, even entangled ones sometimes, and it's just a needle in a haystack. So calling when you're with the animal, and if at all possible to remain with the animal until another boat can take over or, or someone else can get out there um, is the most helpful thing, of course. For a little bit, that is the number for entangled whales. Um, I know it's lots of different phone numbers. So if you don't remember this number, you don't have it in your phone, 
you can just call the regular stranding network number that you saw earlier and let them know what's going on and they will relay the information to the correct uh, responding parties. All right, uh, gone through stuff quickly. I want to share this hopefully heartwarming video because I know myself and uh, the previous presenter talked about maybe some very depressing things, but at the same time, there's still hope out there. You know, people will sometimes ask us, well, why would you help these animals to put them back out in an environment that's not healthy? You have to look at it from the perspective of these animals were struggling because of something people did. So we've remedied that. Obviously, we hope they don't run into that same problem, but if they do, they're now going to be in better body condition and better health than they were before. And hopefully we'll be able to um, fight against that problem or maybe we've mitigated it a bit. So this is one of our release videos of two of our Harbor Seal pups that uh, is pretty cute and it's really fun to see them go back into the wild. So I wanted to share that with you guys. Uh, there is sound, so when you, you might want to turn down your speakers. always happens one wants to come out the other one is like mm, I'm good That was it. That was our uh, intern Ansley cheering at the end there. These guys put a lot of hard work and many, many hours into getting these animals back out to the ocean. So it's uh, always very exciting. Release day is uh, the, the pinnacle of why we do what we do. So thank you guys so much for letting me share with you today. And if there's still time, I'm happy to answer questions. We do have a few questions. So um... Going back, so I think it was this question was asked when you were talking about the lady reporting, like the tracker that looked like it was a cell phone <laughs> that they gone. But like, how are those tracking devices attached? You talked about how one was, you know, kind of like an ear piercing, but the other ones, like that, seem like they're just magically sticking onto their their skin. How does how does that work? Yeah, those are actually glued on. Um, it is a non toxic glue, and then it when the seal molts because they lose their fur once a year. It just comes right off. Great. Um, next question was, how do I report a sighting? And I also want to mention that in the follow-up email to this and in, in the notes to yeah. this video recording, we will include links and phone numbers um, to the Marine Mammal Stranding Network and the general one too, but if you want to answer. Sure, yeah. So the number that was there, the phone number is what you would call. Um, it doesn't operate quite like a sighting network, like Orca Network. Um, you know that all of the they're taking in all of the sightings. Typically, you'd be calling the stranding network if you were concerned about an animal's health, or there was an animal on a very populated beach that you felt maybe people needed to be kind of kept back and give that animal some space. Uh, for general sightings of just interest, particularly for whales, uh, Orca Network is a great one for that. Great, thanks. Um, have you treated any marine mammals with evidence of boat strikes? 
I have in the past, we have not this summer, um, but yes, I, I have seen that before. More common in sea lions or in small cetaceans. It's a little unusual for us to see that in harbor seals, but it does happen. Um, do you analyze blood samples for environmental contaminants like PCBs and other stuff like that? We don't unless there's a researcher that's interested in that. So um, sometimes we will bank something if we will uh, keep the blood basically and freeze it if we suspect something. But typically, or you know, if we do suspect it, we're happy to send it off and check it. But uh, those are very expensive samples to run uh, if you're not suspicious of it. If, you know, looking for low levels and things like that, but we would certainly partner with any researchers or folks that are interested in looking at that. Great. Um, how do you track and monitor the released individuals? So usually it's just by those flipper tags. So if people see them again, or if they should wash up dead somewhere, of course, then we would want to know about that. The satellite trackers are very expensive, <laughs> several thousand dollars a tracker. So we don't do that unless we have a specific study or a specific reason we're looking at multiples of them. So really it's just by, by visual recite if anyone sees them again. And now that I remember, I think that uh, question about who do I call might have been while uh, you were talking about the tracking uh, or like mm -hmm. notice, noticing the trackers. Does that yes. apply for when you see the trackers too? Yes, you can just use that one phone number for everything and they can help get the information to the right party. So you don't have to try and remember, well, who am I supposed to call if you if you forget them and you have SR3's number, again, you're welcome to call us. We'll make sure that the information gets to the right place. Awesome. Um, how do you select places to release them after they've been released? Oh, yeah. I should have mentioned that. Thanks for asking. So typically, we take them back to within about 20 to 30 miles of where they were found. Harbor seals are not migratory, so that's about the range they stay in their whole life. So we try and go back to the area they were found. Great. Do we have any more questions? There's a lot of thank yous in the Oh, comments. great. <laughs> Thanks. I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. And I hope you'll um, take a look at uh, SR3's website and reach out to us if you're near and would like to be volunteers. Uh, perhaps at some point we can arrange a kind of a, a smaller group tour or maybe a virtual tour or something. That would definitely be a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Yeah. And we definitely have quite a number of marine mammals up at Cherry Point. Uh, yes. Recently, this past summer, when we were doing kelp surveys, we saw a bunch of harbor porpoises. I think they were feeding on the forage fish hanging out in the kelp bed. Um, mm -hmm. We've also seen uh, sea lions. We've seen harbor seals. Uh, there have been gray whales kind of off the shore um, feeding more towards Birch Bay. And there's lots of mm -hmm. other uh, really cool, interesting uh, things going on up there. So um, we've also found, uh, we have found marine mammals while doing uh, community science out there. So I think it's really yeah. important too, to know uh, one time we found a, it was pretty sad. It was deceased uh, pregnant harbor porpoise that we found and we mm -hmm. found the marine mammal stranding network and we're able to okay. arrange for a pickup. Um, so yeah, there's lots of valuable data to be learned. I, I did, we found one on San Juan Island that we did an necropsy on, and it turned out it was a um, harbor porpoise and dolls porpoise hybrid with a calf was it, the uh, fetus. Um, so that was really interesting, and I, I don't think that was really well known at that time. Um, so yeah, never discount the value of a dead animal. <laughs> You never know what you'll find out there. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much again. We really appreciated both you and Chris um, presenting and educating us a lot more about uh, marine mammals as well as uh, how the heat wave impacted our near shore marine environment. And I hope now that you all feel inspired to go out and do something and have the knowledge and power to call the marine or call a marine mammal stranding network. If you uh, see anything out there that looks suspicious, uh, remember to not go like pick up a baby seal. <laughs> yeah. I heard some horror stories about people trying to feed baby seals cereal and other stuff like that. Um, don't do that, please. Um, they're really cute and adorable, but uh, pretty please uh, let the people who know how to respond to it, respond to it. Um, and you can help by calling them. Um, so I wanted to say a few closing notes. Um, thank you everyone so much. Like we mentioned earlier, there'll be a follow-up email with more links um, and uh, the recording to this presentation. Uh, and the, well, I'll let Rondi maybe say a few things about how you could get involved with the 
Cherry Point Aquatic Reserve Citizen Search Committee, including the coming up meeting, if you're there, Randy. Yeah, um, we have a stewardship committee meeting coming up next Wednesday on the 3rd. Um, and Cherry Point meets from 3 to 5 p.m. And if you have any questions or would like to get involved, feel free to send me an email with any questions or for the Zoom link as well. Um, yeah, just feel free to reach out. And the meetings are really fun. Sometimes they can be a little technical, but especially if you're interested in the um, management plan updates, please attend or consider attending, I guess. Yeah. And thank you all for coming. And with that, I think that's all we have. And we appreciate you all being here and um, hope to see you in the future at a CSC event or out on the beach or at Cherry Point or anything like that. So thanks so much and enjoy the rest of your, not evening, it's not there yet. It's still just early afternoon. So you got plenty of time to enjoy that sunshine. Thanks so much. Eleanor, I think you are the one that has the ability to end the meeting. I was going to end the meeting. I just uh, noticed that there was a question that we did not respond to. So I'm just copying. Oh, OK. We'll follow up later. But I will end the meeting now. Thanks so much. Great. Awesome. <laughs>